and that's what I care about. I imagine taking my grandkids, if I'm lucky enough to have some, to the park someday, and holding their hands. and hearing their laughter, and watching a quiet sunset. All the while knowing that our work today prevented an alternate future that could have been grim, that our work. Here and now, gave future generations cleaner air, and cleaner water, and a more sustainable planet. And what could be more important than that? Today, thanks to strong, principled, American leadership. That's the world that we'll leave to our children a world that is safer and more secure, more prosperous, and more free. And that is our most important mission in our short time here on this earth. Thanks. Barack Obama Paris Press Conference Delivered December 1, 2015, Isile Moligno, France Good afternoon Once again, I want to thank the people of France and President Hollande for their extraordinary hospitality. Hosting nearly 200 nations is an enormous task for anybody. But to do so just two weeks after the terrorist attacks here is a remarkable display of resolve. And that's why the first place I visited when I arrived on Sunday night was the Bataclan. so that I could pay my respects on behalf of the American people who share the French people's resolve. It was a powerful reminder of the awful human toll of those attacks. Our hearts continue to go out to the victims' families.
but here in Paris. We also see the resilience of the universal values that we share liberté, égalité, fraternité. And based on my discussions with President Olan and other leaders. I am confident that we can continue building momentum and adding resources to our effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. To disrupt plots against America and our allies. and to bring about the political resolution necessary to resolve the situation in Syria and relieve the hardships on the Syrian people. Now, this has been a quick visit. Of course, all visits to Paris seem quick you always want to stay a little bit longer. But we have. Accomplished a lot here. I have high hopes that over the next two weeks, we'll accomplish even more. I know some have asked why the world would dedicate some of our focus right now to combating. Climate change even as we work to protect our people and go after terrorist networks. The reason is because this one trend climate change affects all trends. If we let the world keep warming as fast as it is, and sea levels rising as fast as they are, and weather patterns keep shifting in more unexpected ways than before long. We are going to have to devote more and more and more of our economic and military resources not to growing opportunity for our people. but to adapting to the various consequences of a changing planet. This is an economic and security imperative that we have to tackle now. and great nations can handle a lot at once. America is already leading on many issues, and climate is no different.
we've made significant progress at home increasing production of clean energy. Working to reduce emissions, while our businesses have kept creating jobs for 68 straight months. And we've been able to lower our unemployment rate to 5% in the process. And since we worked with China last year to show that the two largest economies and two largest emitters can cooperate on climate. More than 180 countries have followed our lead in announcing their own targets. The task that remains here in Paris is to turn these achievements into an enduring. Framework for progress that gives the world confidence in a low-carbon future. As I said yesterday, what we seek is an agreement where progress paves the way for countries to update their emissions targets on a regular basis. And each nation has the confidence that other nations are meeting their commitments. We seek an agreement that makes sure developing nations have the resources they need to skip the dirty phase of development if they're willing to do their part. And that makes sure the nations most vulnerable to climate change have resources to adapt to the impacts we can no longer avoid. We seek an agreement that gives businesses and investors the certainty that the global economy is on a firm path towards a low-carbon future. Because that will spur the kind of investment that will be vital to combine reduced emissions with economic growth. That's the goal. Not just an agreement to roll back the pollution that threatens our planet. But an agreement that helps our economies grow and our people to thrive without. Condemning the next generation to a planet that is beyond its capacity to repair.
Now, all of this will be hard. Getting 200 nations to agree on anything is hard. And I'm sure there will be. Moments over the next two weeks where progress seems stymied, and everyone rushes to write that we are doomed. But I'm convinced that we're going to get big things done here. Keep in mind, nobody expected that 180 countries would show up in Paris with serious climate targets in hand. Nobody expected that the price of clean energy would fall as fast as it has, or that back in the United States. The solar industry would be creating jobs ten times faster than the rest of the economy. Nobody expected that more than 150 of America's biggest companies would pledge their support to an ambitious Paris outcome or that a couple dozen of the world's wealthiest private citizens would join us. Here to pledge to invest unprecedented resources to bring clean energy technologies to market faster. What gives me confidence that progress is possible is somebody like Bill Gates who I was with. Yesterday understands that tackling climate change is not just a moral imperative, it's an opportunity. Without batting an eye, he said we're just going to have to go. Ahead and invent some new technologies to tackle this challenge. That kind of optimism, that kind of sense that we can do what is necessary is infectious. And you tend to believe somebody like Bill when he says that we're going to get it done since he's done some pretty remarkable things. And I believe that a successful two weeks here could give the world that same kind of optimism that the future is ours to shape. So, with that, 
I'm going to take a few questions. We'll start with Jerome Cartillier of AFP. Where's Jerome? Question, good morning, sir, and thank you, MR. President. For months now, you've been asking MR. Putin to play basically a more constructive role in Syria. Basically shifting from defending Assad to attacking ISIL. It appears your calls have not been heard. What's your strategy going forward? President Obama, well, I'm not sure that's true. The fact that the Vienna process is moving forward. Steadily not conclusively, but steadily I think is an indication that MR. Putin recognizes there is not going to be a military resolution to the situation in Syria. The Russians now have been there for several weeks, over a month. And I think fair-minded reporters who looked at the situation would say that the situation hasn't changed significantly. In the interim, Russia has lost a commercial passenger jet. You've seen another jet shot. down. There have been losses in terms of Russian personnel. And I think Mr. Putin understands that. With Afghanistan fresh in the memory, for him to simply get bogged down in. Inconclusive and paralyzing civil conflict is not the outcome that he's looking for. Now, where we continue to have an ongoing difference is not on the need for a political settlement. It's the issue of whether MR. Assad can continue to serve as president while still bringing the civil war to an end.
it's been my estimation for five years now that that's not possible. Regardless of how you feel. About Mr. Assad and I consider somebody who kills hundreds of thousands of his own people. Illegitimate but regardless of the moral equation, as a practical matter, it is impossible for Mr. Assad to bring that country together and to bring all the parties into an inclusive government. It is possible, however, to preserve the Syrian state. To have an inclusive government in which the interests of the various groups inside of Syria are represented. And so, as part of the Vienna process, you're going to see the opposition groups the moderate. Opposition groups that exist within Syria some of which, frankly, We don't have a lot in common with but do represent significant factions inside of Syria they'll be coming together. In order for them to form at least a negotiating unit or process that can move Vienna forward. And we're going to just keep on working at this. And my hope and expectation is, is that political track will move at the same time as we continue to apply greater and greater pressure on ISIL. And with the contributions that the French have made, the Germans have recently announced additional resources to the fight. The Brits have been steady partners in Iraq and I think are now. Very interested in how they can expand their efforts to help deal with ISIL inside of Syria. With not just the cohesion of the coalition the United States put together but also the increasing intensity of our actions in the air and progressively on the ground. I think it is possible over the next several months that we both see a shift in calculation in
the Russians and a recognition that it's time to bring the civil war in Syria to a close.